Two, three, four. Run up your engine! Today I'm going to show you how to fix a car's AC that the refrigerant's leaking out of. Now in the case of this Nissan Maxima, the customer tried fixing it himself. He got a recharge kit and he put an AC refrigerant back in the system. And it would last three or four days, then it would empty out. Tried that a couple of times and realized, well, it's leaking somewhere, so he brought it to me. Now sometimes it's a royal pain in the rear end trying to find a leak, but in this case, once I jacked it up, it was easy to tell. Up it goes. And once we look under it, we can see right here, bottom of the compressor's all wet. I put some leak dye in, and the dye was coming out in the middle. That means that it's leaking in the middle seals. As you can see, even without the UV glasses, that's green dye there, and it's coming from here. The compressor's just shot. And in this case, there's not much working room, so we're gonna take the wheel off so we can access it better. But before I pull the wheel off, you gotta decide, do you really wanna spend the correct money to fix the AC? It's an older car. Well, in this case, the system works perfectly fine. It's just leaking there. So it's not like you gotta replace all the parts, the condenser, evaporator, all that stuff, because we know the system's working, it's just leaking. And we pray that it is only leaking on the compressor. Now, my advice is this. Price out a brand new compressor. Do not use rebuilt. Over the years, I try to save customers money using rebuild AC compressors. They almost all bit me in the rear end, either a day later, a week later, a month, or a year later. They often break. They're cheaply made enough as it is. You buy a rebuilt one, it's just a broken one that's been fixed. Get a new one, and if you decide, like in this case, it's only leaking, and you can afford a new one, heck, put a new compressor on it. Ah! Plastic crap's in the way. This thing's been hit so many times. There's some straps. They got rigged to put them on, so we'll cut the strap off. They got some of it off. Get a prior and we'll pry some of these plastic clips off. They always break, so we don't care. I got boxes of new ones. Now we can access it. There's the compressor. Now the first thing we have to remove is the fan belt. This is the tensioner so we get a real long ratchet so we get a lot of room and when we pull on it, it loosens the tension and we can get the belt off. And as you can see here now, we just slipped the belt off the compressor. Now we can take all the bolts off and get the compressor off. So we remove the two bolts in the front and we'll reach inside. Uh, and we unplug the electrical connection. Now that's gone. Now those are the two front ones. Here's the new compressor. And there's also two on the back you have to remove. There is no working room. There's no filming room. So I can't film that because you can't see it. I do that blind. And also blind is the other side. There's the two line where the refrigerant hoses go. I can't film it because there's no working room, but you get in there and take the lines off, which I'm going to do now. And since I have to crawl under there, I'm putting this jack stand under there first so it doesn't crush me. Now you can see I got the long ratchet here because it takes a lot of stuff to break it loose. Uh, there. Now we're getting it loose. Then we get the old compressor. Uh. See if the new one matches up. Got the same bolt holes. Got the same connector, so it should work. So we'll slide it back in from the bottom. Gravity helps a little here when you take it off, but now we're going against gravity, putting it back on. Now you can't win them all. A lot of wiggling. They don't give you much room on these things, that's for sure. And we'll go inside here, and we'll belt the compressor on here and here and on the bottom, and put the fan belt back on. When you pull that, it loosens it. Then you can snap the belt on. And as you can see, the belt's now on nice and tight all the way around. You want to feel to make sure it's on tight. You don't want it loose on a groove. Now this particular compressor, it came with oil already in it. So we have to add refrigerant, but first we have to evacuate the system to get all the air out. Now by law you're supposed to recycle the old refrigerant, but this had all leaked out, the system was empty, so you don't need that. All you need is a set of gauges, put it on the low side here, snap it on, open it up, then hook it up to a vacuum pump. Just screw it on and plug it in. Won't work if you don't plug it in. I turn the switch on. Then open the gauge and it will evacuate the system. Now you can't have air in an AC system. It's got water vapor, it messes with it. So you want to put the vacuum pump on for about an hour. That will suck all of the air out of the system and make a vacuum. Then we'll refill it with refrigerant. And we don't even have to guess. There's a sticker here. It says to use 0.55 kilograms. So it's been about an hour now. Close the valve and hook the line up to the tank of refrigerant. Then we'll add the refrigerant. 
We use the reverse scale, so we'll do it until it's 0.55. And now it's full. The pressure's right, and when we go inside the car, what's happening? Ah. When we go into the car, you can see the compressor here spinning perfectly fine. There it is, spinning away, not making any noises. Success. And of course, we gotta clean up the mess, put the tire and everything back on. As you can see, it's a job that can be done with normal hand tools, except you need a vacuum pump and gauges. Hey, they don't cost all that much. I got my vacuum pump at Harbor Freight Tools for 70 bucks on sale. And AutoZone, they loan them out for free. So you can loan one if you want. You don't even have to buy one. Sometimes it's a lot simpler than you think. This is now going in the recycle bin. And here's some bonus questions and answers. Moments, uh, Scotty, what do you think about buying a brand new 2020 Nissan? Well, I'd have my head checked on that one. I wouldn't buy any new Nissan products. The uh, company's on the verge of bankruptcy. They lost 70-something percent of their sales last quarter. And then their partner, Renault, they're in the same financial problem. And they had that deal where they cheated and lied about sales. I mean, they're in a real pickle. And they're not very well made. I wouldn't buy one. The only vehicle if I was forced to buy would be like a Frontier. They're little pickup trucks because they cost less. And they're decent. They're okay. I mean, the Toyotas are better, but you can get the Nissan so much cheaper that I've had customers buy the Nissan Frontier pickup trucks. And they were relatively satisfied with them as time goes on. But the cars, no. Dortmund 5301 says, Scotty, you watch your channel every day. I have a 1985 Toyota MR2. It's been in storage and left it by my father. I can't get it started. What should I check first? He's got a picture of it. Oh, man, the thing's in pretty good shape. Body's not smashed in or anything. It's got one broken rear window, but that's no big deal. You can buy one of those. Watch my video, getting an old car started that's sat for years, and do that. The first thing you want to do is get a long extension bar and a socket. Put it on the crank bolt on the bottom of the engine. See if you can turn the engine over. If you can't make it turn two total revolutions, you get part way and then it locks and doesn't move, the engine's locked up. Then you're going to have to rebuild the engine, which is very big expense. Do that first. It's all in my video. But if you can, then you want to get a good battery, get some starting fluid, make sure it's got oil and coolant in it, and try to start it with a little starting fluid. Just watch that video. Get in a car going and set for years, Scotty, and you'll be able to see all the steps. Good luck with it, because it's a nice looking car. Hey, uh, it's a nice looking car. Pop up headlights and everything. G092 says, hey, Scotty, what's the story behind Chevy's bow tie emblem? Most companies use the first letter of their name or logo or even a whole name spelled out. Thanks. Well, no, there's all kinds of arguments about it. But the best one that I've heard was Chevrolet's too long, right? Too long of a name. So in the early 1900s, I believe it was the son of the owner was in Paris. And he went to some fancy hotel, and the story goes that that was a design that was on the wallpaper <laughs> on the hotel. He didn't say if it was a cat house or something. Maybe it was. I don't know. But he said they said he liked that design, so they did it. And originally, of course, it always said Chevrolet inside it. Now, a lot of times, it's just the bow tie design. That makes the most sense to me. Nobody could prove anything one way or the other because the hotel's been torn down. So... <laughs> But it kind of makes sense, you know, the guy saw something that looked good, and it's kind of an interesting design, you got to say, it got a little pizzazz to it. Honda One Love says, what product would you recommend to remove sludge? Don't go overboard. Some people say, Scotty, you know, should I put sludge remover in my engine and run it for five minutes every time before I change the oil to get everything out? No, it's not a good idea. You can actually damage by removing too much stuff. There's a little bit of wear and carbon and stuff that's needed to seal everything, right? So you don't want to do it all the time. But if you happen to have bought a crapper or let's say your friend or something never changed his oil, it's all crummy, and you want to help him out, get the gunk sludge remover, follow directions on the can. It's very simple to do. Then you change the oil and filter, and that often removes a lot of the sludge. They're good products. Black World 30 says, would a transmission cooler cause a slight decrease in miles per gallon? It actually could, very small amount. If it makes it run too cool, the transmission won't be operating at its temperature that's the correct temperature it was designed for. They're made to run at a certain temperature. If they're too cool, they actually won't work as efficiently. And of course, the pump also has to now pump through there, so the pump's going to work a little bit harder. But it wouldn't be that drastic, you know, if you really looked at it, it might be, you know, in the tenths of a mile a gallon or even less than that. It wouldn't be all that much. The main thing is you don't want a transmission running too hot, but you also don't want it running too cool. If you're going to do that, I would put a temperature gauge on the system. Let's find out what temperature it should run at. If it's running too cool, then I'd take it off. If it runs normal, I'd leave it on.
So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.